Hey, and we are the Coalition Loud and Proud, Civilly Disobedient Media, broadcasting live. Well, we are here at Brood Awakenings in Johnston, Rhode Island. It's a spectacular, I'll call it late summer, perhaps, dare I say, early fall afternoon. I'm here with Dan Kiesler, and he is with Parabellum Provisions here, an organization based in Rhode Island. And we're going to have a, a little bit of a conversation with a little bit of background, a little bit of flavor, and a very, very current event. Dan, thanks for joining me this afternoon. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. The Talk to us about Parabellum Provisions. Give us a, a little flavor as to its background. This is an organization that, while relatively new, predates the current events that we're about to discuss. Absolutely, absolutely. Tell us a little background. Sure. Uh, the uh, organization was founded as a uh, 501c4 nonprofit in January of this year. And uh, the idea behind it was that... We wanted to create an organization that had a global goal or a, a regional goal in our area of providing resources of all of the resources available to like-minded people. We wanted to put an organization together that the ideal behind was to uplift individuals and help them be confident and achieved people at skill sets that help them to be thrive because we believe that in a community to be successful all the individuals have to be successful too. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to do something that shared the resources that are available for training events, for mental health events, for legislative events, to kind of encompass everything and put it in one place so that people could go and see if they're looking for an organization that can do this. We're, we, we're going to try to get it up. So that scope is fairly broad. It is. Uh, you know, and, and you're wearing a shirt that, that states your affinity for the, for the NRA. Uh, how much of that uh, scope is based in firearms training and, and firearms knowledge and safety skills? And, and what other skills are you bringing in into the mix? A lot of it is based on the firearms training and skills. Uh, several of the uh, directors of the organization are instructors for the NRA and the USCCA. Uh, we, our group, uh, comes together to help host free classes that are run monthly for safety, specifically safety firearm classes that we have filled for a year now. The classes are full, pretty much, and. Uh, we also have worked with other organizations. As, as you're aware, we did something with the Leadership Institute uh, last month, and we're talking with them. They're going to try to do quarterly classes, and we're going to try to partner with them to do that as well. Uh, we follow the legislation uh, involved with the 2A in this state very closely, and we also have a legislative section to our site where we're going to be staying on top of not only Rhode Island's laws, but other cases in the country we're going to put up too that are affecting our Second Amendment rights. So that's a very big part of our organization. At its most primary level, how important is safety training, if you will, and this will sound in one sense pretty obvious, but to both the confidence and the respect of people who are around firearms, sometimes by choice, sometimes not, and what impact does that have particularly on young people? It's the most important thing and there are some organizations now that are working within the state to try as you know they used to have uh, safety training classes in our schools years back and mm -hmm. rifle clubs and teams and there's a, a drive being started now to try to institute that here which I don't know if it will go anywhere but safety is the most critical thing and there are a lot of people that have grown up with firearms that know how to handle them because they were taught by people who had those classes in their schools and they came through a system that was very different from what we have now. But in, in our environment, particularly in this state, it's hard to get the information out about these classes are available in, in a very large-scale public manner. So that's kind of why we try to like let the 2A portion be not so upfront. Mm -hmm. So we can push lots of educational opportunities and also say these these classes are available. But it's it's paramount that you have safety training, that you know how to store it, you know what to do with it. Uh, my children, who are they're 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 teens now, but when they were younger, uh, if someone 
found a firearm, you want my kids to find it because they know how to clear it, disarm it, and make it safe. And, and they learn that growing up. So it's the most important part. Now that importance transcends community, transcends race, transcends ethnicity. Uh, there's this notion out there that some would uh, hang their hat on that this is showing to be really available in the suburbs or rural communities, but uh, don't our urban youth need these training as well? Don't they need this understanding? Don't they need this sort of, I'll call it, firearm maturity? So, Pat, if, if the mantra in society today is that firearm safety or, or gun violence, I'm going to use a term I don't agree with, because that's what's publicized widely, is one of the largest problems in our society today, then wouldn't safety be the first step in preventing that or negating it or combating it? In your opinion, is the power of firearms and, and, and the potential for lethal force, is it conveyed or professionally via safety and firearms trainings or scare tactics? Scare tactics, completely scare tactics. With the, with the safety classes, you're taught a, a respect for a tool, just mm -hmm. like a, a radial arm saw or a power saw. If you don't use the tool properly, it can cause mortal injuries. So if we continue to scare away our children, our young people, or we continue to anesthetize them, if you will, to the power of firearms through video games and things like that, absent any real connection to that, aren't we doing them a potential mortal disservice? Yes, and, and uh, <laughs> this is that's a complex issue. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you the reason that I think that. I, I had a 17, 18-year-old gentleman come through one of the classes that we've run here. Mm -hmm. And he held an AR-15 admittedly for the first time he'd ever touched one and he showed me how to operate it correctly now I'm not saying he could handle it firing and stuff and I asked him where he learned it and he said a video game wow okay so there, see that coming <laughs> there's some legitimacy to, to some of those claims I think mm -hmm. okay fair enough uh, you're aware more so than most that the official sport of Rhode Island is not football because we don't need no stinking football when we got politics. I am well aware. Now, <laughs> in the last few years, I believe a highly cynical matter, affairs of state, and they could be civil rights issues, they could be economic development issues, ha have begun to move away from public discourse, public debate on a standalone basis to be buried, I believe, in a very cowardly manner in the state's budget. And the reason underlying that, uh, as has been made clear to us, is that by tying it to the state's budget, then you effectively politicize what may be a civil rights or an economic development issue. You, you, you again, inoculate it from the kind of public debate and scrutiny that's necessary. Because politically, the budget's got to pass. God forbid we don't have a budget. There's sarcasm there. <laughs> no, agreed. <laughs> so I'll take a, 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 a non... Maybe not one that's larger than the Chicago's, but right. yeah, we have to have a budget. Right. So and I, I'll use an example, the soccer stadium. In the waning days of the now-failed, unlamented Pawtucket Red Sox Stadium subsidy, the state and the city of Pawtucket, and I believe in a, in a highly cynical move, Rather than debate the soccer stadium subsidy in the same way that the baseball stadium were debated, that was moved into the budget. And there was no public testimony, there were no public hearings. Uh, if they were, the few that uh, public hearings, they, they weren't on the grand scale of the baseball stadium. And the reason why is because when confronted with the reality that Rhode Islanders don't want their taxpayer money being used to subsidize private corporations, the state political class had to retreat. Right? In the budget, 
Yeah. Where to you know, you it's kind of there, it's kind of not there. Again, most of us do lead at some level lives of quiet desperation where a lot of folks are just trying to get whatever to take gets you through the night. It's all right, right? Uh, they don't have this the bandwidth to pay attention to all these issues that are buried in this gigantic cloud called state government. That's the reason why we have a soccer stadium subsidy, and we are going to inherit in a few years a failed, beyond failed elephant. A, a soccer stadium subsidy for a privately owned company. Right. Rhode Islanders were shocked last week when something similar happened to a fundamental civil right, that is your right to bear arms. And at this moment, I'd like to remind people that the Rhode Island State Constitution says that your right to bear arms shall not be infringed. <laughs> Period. It stops there. Yeah. We actually, allegedly, have a stricter constitution right to bear arms in Rhode Island than we do at the nation writ large under the federal Correct. constitution. What happened? Tell me what happened, and as a result, what the reaction from your organization is. So, the governor... Uh, posted a video or someone posted a video clip of the governor making the statement that uh, because our legislature in his words were unable to pass the uh, assault weapons ban that next legislative season that he was going to insert it into the budget because he knows we have to pass the state's budget and the issues with that are are many but the main issue with that is we're talking about a criminal statute that carries prison sentences and large fines. And not only is it restrictive of a God-given, unalienable right, it completely negates the process of public debate, public discourse. It takes away the individual debates from our legislators where they get individual one-on-one -on -one votes on the bills. It strips the democratic process away when he adds particularly criminal elements into our state's budget. So we sat together and we thought, legislative season is six months out. If we start a petition now, mainly focused on the mechanism, we, we, liked the, we didn't like the cause, but we chose it because he's, they're picking on a cause that's dear to our hearts and it's a right that was granted by our Creator. If that had been any other right, it wouldn't have mattered, nor would it have mattered if it were a Democrat or a Republican. It's a nonpartisan issue when a governor in power wants to place criminal legislation into a state's budget. It, it just should not happen. So we put a petition together to try and get signatures and we have six months to go. We're placing them in different locations that are willing to host throughout the state and we've also put copies of the petition on our website which is parabellumprovisions.org if you'd like to sign it electronically we have it available there and, and our goal is to reach further to all the clubs, organizations, any businesses that will host it and currently uh, we have, uh, we just started this last week but we currently have uh, petitions physically at Flat River Tavern and also at Athens Pizza. And those are two locations now, but we'll be adding locations as we go. It's very important that, that people, regardless of your party, understands that this type of mechanism being used to pass pet projects that our legislature has been unable to pass for the past several years completely defeats the whole purpose of having a democratic process. <laughs> it, it, what's stunning is the willingness of a variety of organizations in the state to look past this. Agreed. You know, it, it's there's a tired old statement about first they came for it, and then they came for it, and then they came for it. Um, Imagine, if you will, that if on the side that the balance of our state's political composition was opposed to, decided to, within the state's budget, incorporate a civil right near and dear to them, right. the reaction would be breathtaking. It would. Yet they're willing, in some sense, there's been a... There's been, Opposition to this has been highly muted from organizations that should know better. Mm -hmm. 
because they've, quite frankly, whether it's ethnic or racial, in case, some cases financial, have been the victims, if you will, of state-sponsored oppression themselves. <laughs> Particularly when we're speaking about the, the firearms legislation and some of the, the, the legislation that's been passed are far more restrictive to lower income and minorities than others. I mean, the, the, the legislation itself is racist. And, and this, is, this is a country uh, where we are not supposed to care about race, religion, natural origin, and I don't see that being upheld. A significant number of the gun laws, as evidenced during the stop and frisk era of the war on drugs, was targeted directly at inner city youth, young people of color. Mm -hmm. You didn't see stop and frisk on the main streets of East Greenwich. You certainly didn't see it in Barrington. Mm -hmm. Towns like Cumberland or Smithfield were largely inoculated. The, there was an organization in the Providence Police years ago called, they were nicknamed the Jump Out Boys. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but the Jump Out Boys were an anti-gang unit, and they were called the Jump Out Boys because they effectively the police car would pull up on the curb, and they jump out. And that members of the Providence law enforcement community would jump out in a show of force and do what they did. And this is is far more, far more dangerous. Indeed. What's your reception been so far from people? Uh, well, as I said, we just got the uh, website launched Wednesday of last week, and it's been good. It's been very good, and folks are working with us. We're going to spend, as I said, we have six months, so we're going to be reaching out to more organizations. We're going to be hitting some events mm -hmm. around the state, particularly some of the events at the at the ranges and clubs. Right. And, and bringing those out, but we're going to try to do this in a manner because of the mechanism being used where we can get a broader audience. Right. And, and Because, as I said, although the assault weapons ban portion is near and dear to what I believe our country stands for, the mechanism that's being used is the real issue here. And, and, and if I might add this, we, we have several candidates that are running this election cycle that believe in our rights as as our founders intended and folks need to get out and really ask the people that represent them now when election day comes if they actually represent their values and put people in office that do will you be publishing any type of poll or questionnaire to uh, candidates running for say the general assembly uh, we hadn't thought about that, but it's not a bad idea. I actually know most of them personally, so. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's that's not a bad idea to publish. Right, some sort of report card. Yeah, sure. And also, if you go to the website, our plan is with this petition. If you sign it electronically, you can see how many signatures we have. Mm -hmm. and as I said, we've only been running since Wednesday. We're going to collect the paper petitions monthly tabulate that number and post that. We we want this process to be completely transparent. Excellent, excellent. Well, again, if I can sum this up, the issue here is far less Second Amendment than the overriding concern, and I'm using the term concern lightly here, for, of moving civil rights issues and burying it into a $14 billion budget, as if somehow your civil rights can be assigned a monetary grade. Your wording is uh, better than mine, but agreed wholeheartedly. Agreed wholeheartedly. And uh, for, fortunately for, for us, they picked uh, they picked something that's dear and dear to, to us to do this with. But I would have been as much on board had it been any other criminal or civil liberty that they were trying to write off in our budget. Because the ultimate question is, what's next? Exactly. That is literally the question. You know, if, when folks use the word slippery slope, uh, you can almost see eyes glaze over at this point. This isn't a slippery slope. This is an avalanche. And as a result, needs to be treated, regardless of your thoughts on the Second Amendment, as nothing less than a, in a first-level attempt at a suppression of your civil liberties. And... Again, the Coalition Radio Network, we've, you know, we've never been shy about pointing out that it's uh, libertarian-based and, and ultimately believes 
and trusts in the rights of the individual because as a libertarian we believe that we represent the rights of the ultimate minority, the individual. And whether that take place in a, in a palatable format to some, which is our opposition to the horrific use of violence against against individuals in our state's criminal justice system, whether it be the abuse of power that our state holds by using the force of government to separate individuals from their own personal wealth and use it to whatever they design, whether it be the state's violation of our civil liberties during the COVID crisis, whether it be any of this, whether that issue appeals to the left, the right, the center, that's irrelevant to us. The only thing that matters is the rights of the individual. Because the collective cannot exist if, in fact, if those rights are stripped away. I agree. So, thank you for joining us today. One more time, if you could spell out the website, because I, I, I know antebellum, parabellum is probably a, a little bit new to some folks. I, I can. It's P A R A B E L L U M provisions as one word. Dot org and if I may add this at the end mm -hmm. Pat uh, if if any of you have a business and you would like to host this petition in your businesses if you go to that website and hit the contact us icon at the bottom of the page there's a form you can fill out and we will get back to you immediately that's a 501c4 so people can donate right. and it's not a tax deductible donation because the under the IRS code, you're considered a social organization as opposed to a charitable organization. Uh, how can folks donate? Is there a link on the website? Uh, we have not set up a donation site yet. We just got the full site launched yesterday. Right. So it's 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 all uh, it's all developing, but it is in the works. Excellent. So very it, it, to to a large degree, the I'll call it the state-sponsored violence, if you will, by the McKee administration. My terms, all right. I like uh, it. Yeah, <laughs> has essentially greatly heightened the development of your organization, and and really brought it into the forefront. What's at stake here? Because I'll close with this: if you don't understand your civil liberties, if you don't under civil, understand your civil rights, how can you possibly fight for them? Uh, that's a much longer conversation because those aren't even being taught in our schools now. <laughs> Fair enough. But listen, again, Mr. Kiesler, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um,